I live in a small rural town in Pennsylvania. I believe in taking care of myself. I keep a balanced diet and a rigorous exercise routine. In the morning, if my face is a little puffy, I'll put on my ghost face mask while I practice my machete chops. I can do a thousand now. In the shower, I use a water-activated deep cleaning 3-in-1 men's body wash, and then I turn on the Keurig for caffeine as I finish my routine. Not alcohol, because alcohol dries out your skin and makes you look older. Then I make sure I go see my floof, a perfect specimen, the subtle off-white coloring, the tasteful thickness of it. My god, it even has a floofy tail. There is an idea of a real-life Ryan, and there is no real-life me, only an entity, and though I can hide my cold gaze, I am simply not there. American Psycho is one of those films that I think you can enjoy in three different ways. The first way is believing it's a horror movie, and to me that's the most far-fetched one, but I can see how it's maybe horror-adjacent. You got the word psycho in the title, the cover of Christian Bale holding a big knife, there's a couple murders in the movie, Christian Bale running around naked with a chainsaw killing hookers. Okay, it's a little bit horror, sure. You can also view it as a psychological mindfuck kind of movie, the kind of movie where you look deeply at the commentary on the conforming nature of the 1980s Wall Street era, the lack of basic human identity, and the amount of repression that this would cause in a person who feels like he's a carbon copy of everything else, and by night, he unleashes his dark, twisted fantasies in order to have some release from the modern-day grind, and to exploit his disdain for those not conforming like he does. Such as when Christian Bale is running around naked with a chainsaw killing hookers. And then, of course, the question of how much of this film is real, and how much was only Bateman's fantasies. The third way to view the film is as a comedy, because Bale's delivery and timing of his lines and actions in this movie are so over-the-top and ridiculous that it just is absolutely hysterical at times, just like when Christian Bale is running around naked with a chainsaw killing hookers. It's hilarious! No, but American Psycho is, honest to God, such a unique and weird movie. Every scene is like its own little moment. There is an overall narrative, kind of, sort of, but this movie isn't remembered for its structure, but the individual moments that are either hysterical, shocking, or scarily relatable. And I'm definitely going to be spoiling the film in this analysis, so if you have not seen the movie, be forewarned. And I would recommend this movie if you feel like you need something a little different, and if you are stuck at home, unable to get your reservation at Dorcia. Christian Bale plays this guy named Patrick Bateman, a man that works within a lucrative business, takes pristine care of his body, has the best and most expensive suits, haircuts, apartment, and essentially lives what would be the ideal life. On the surface, these are people that make the world go round, having super important meetings and business lunches, a standard of living that not just Patrick, but everyone around him strives for. And though we only see things through Patrick's perspective, it's clear that each and every one of these guys is pretty much completely interchangeable. They all talk very formally and officially about what little work there actually is, and then behind closed doors, they all do drugs, they all cheat on their wives, and they all kind of have it out for one another waiting for the first one of them to slip up so they can begin to ostracize them from the tribe. It's to the point where they can even masquerade as one another, take on a different name or identity, and nobody really bats an eye. And this is where the movie's satirical edge pushes into the more ridiculous nature of it, but it also works in the best kind of way. It's like everybody has never actually spent any time getting to know the other person that they're talking to. It's just another guy in a suit with a good haircut and some expensive cologne. There is an image to uphold here that Patrick very strictly holds himself to, but because of this, Patrick is an empty soul. He's not really a person, he's the idea of a person, made clear that he can completely take on the identity of another and continue walking through life as though nothing has changed. And this rigid way of life, this desire to uphold this image, is what rips away at Patrick's sanity from the back end. You would think someone that has such a well-established life, the money, the women, the status, the clout, that Patrick should be a happy guy. 
but he's anything but. Instead, even the slightest little inconvenience or annoyance will set him off into a position of war. Seeing a homeless man on the street and feeling the need to berate him and show his superiority before stabbing the man to death, of course. Uh, his sheets not being clean on the schedule that he was expecting. Or, of course, the thought of that stupid bastard Paul Allen showing him up with his business card. This is one of those scenes where, if you have the right sense of humor, it's one of the funniest scenes in the movie. Or you could just see it as Patrick's superficial narcissism leaking out in a subtle showcase of homicidal rage right behind his eyes. Jared Leto plays the other businessman, Paul Allen, who mistakes Bateman as another man entirely and leaves his new business card for all to see, way fancier and even with a watermark. So obviously, Paul Allen has to die. Bateman takes him out to dinner, still acting like the man that Allen has mistaken him for, then later at his apartment, gives him a history lesson on Huey Lewis in the news before driving an axe into the back of his head. Probably the most famous scene of the entire movie, Again, it can be seen as horrific or hilarious, depending on how you want to watch the movie. Bateman begins discussing the band and the album that he's playing for Alan, while putting on a raincoat over his suit to avoid the oncoming blood splatter, and afterwards, rewarding himself with a nice cigar. It's the extreme overreaction of viciously murdering someone for no real reason at all. Just a mild annoyance, just a business card, and the fact that Alan said he was able to get reservations at Dorcia, which nobody else can really seem to get. Dorcia is this restaurant that is mentioned over and over again in the movie about how high-end it is and how important you are if you manage to get reservations there. But literally nobody in the movie ever actually goes there. I think it's just another one of those subtle humor things where the characters want to feel superior and high status, so they assume or say they will get reservations at Dorcia, but none of them actually do, which is just a great joke to thread through the entire movie. We also have this investigator played by Willem Dafoe, and truthfully, he's only in a few scenes in the movie, but to add to the mindfuck aspect of the film, he was told to play the role in multiple ways. One way is that he knows that Bateman is the killer. The other way is that he thinks that Bateman is not the killer. And the third way is that he is unsure if Bateman is or is not the killer. Then all three versions of him playing the character and his performance were spliced together scene to scene to keep the audience guessing as to what is really going on. Because there are arguments to be made that throughout this movie, Bateman doesn't actually kill anybody. There's moments where he shouts out loud that he wants to stab a girl to death, but she acts like she didn't even hear him, kind of like it's only within his head. The killing of Paul Allen and Paul Allen going missing for a bit could just be a coincidence. Also, perhaps, maybe that wasn't even really Paul Allen. All of these characters are interchangeable, like I said, and like Patrick, nobody can remember who was with who or when they were with each other. The detective even mentions that Bateman has an alibi, that Bateman didn't even know about. He said that he was with Alan and a bunch of others out at a dinner that night, but that's not true at all. More than likely, someone just thought it was Bateman and like Alan, thought Bateman was somebody else. This mass of conformity and image takes over the individual and it's hard to say who was actually where and when. Bateman is also engaged to Reese Witherspoon's character, but there is no chemistry here. It's just for the perception. Instead, Bateman gets his rocks off by ordering some hookers and making them eat each other's assholes. Sabrina, don't just stare at it, eat it. Which I honestly can appreciate. He also goes by a fake name here and famously films himself having sex with them so that he can look at how awesome he is while he's having sex. Man, he's just like me, for real. But of course, later on, he uses that same hooker in another threesome, and look, I'm all about earning your red wings if you want to, but Bateman takes it a little bit too far. This is probably the most horror-centric scene in the entire movie, not just being chased around with a chainsaw, but also finding all the dead bodies laid around his apartment. But again, I kind of can't help but laugh because I love that Bateman is just completely naked, covered in blood, running around with a chainsaw, but he also has these squeaky clean white shoes on at the same time. It's that kind of thing that if you find that stuff hilarious, this entire movie is going to make you laugh from start to finish. But the nature of Bateman's need to lash out from the crowd into the darker and darker releases, it goes from 0 to 100 real quick. After a few murders, he starts trying to shove a cat into an ATM, starts shooting random people, and even police officers. And then he thinks he's being chased by a police helicopter. 
He eventually makes his way into his office and makes a huge confession to all his killings, if they did happen. Because see, the few ending scenes of the movie is where it becomes intentionally confusing for the viewer. Bateman returns to his apartment, but was it actually his apartment? Or was it Paul Allen's apartment? Or any of the other names that he let himself be known by throughout the movie? The apartment is now cleaned, the bodies are gone, and a realtor who seems to know exactly what happened tells Bateman to leave in a way that is actually kind of spooking Bateman. Our resident killer of the entire film is getting backed away by this little old lady, and I think it's a moment where you could say real recognizes real. No matter what the profession, businessman or realtor, it's all about the image to uphold. She can't sell with bodies around in the apartment, so she got rid of them all. And the fact that she is so uncaring about it and seems to know that Bateman did it and just tells him to get the fuck out, or maybe this is just how Bateman is seeing it and there was no dead bodies to begin with. He believes that she took care of them and is freaked out because of that, but did it really happen? The movie doesn't give you a clear answer. Not if the killings really did take place or not, but the scariest thing that the movie is trying to say is that it doesn't matter. Life continues as normal. It will be forgotten. It will blend in. It will be brushed off. In the superficial areas of the world, nothing matters. The final scene has Bateman face to face with his lawyer, but his lawyer doesn't even recognize him. Again, thinking that he's somebody else, everything and everyone being so interchangeable. He thought Bateman's murder confession was just a joke, and it's not even possible because he had dinner with Paul Allen not that long ago. But who the fuck is Paul Allen? Anybody could say they were him. Maybe he died, maybe he went missing, maybe he's still out there. Maybe Jerry Leto wasn't actually Paul Allen. Maybe Bateman is Paul Allen, but it doesn't matter because... Even the pent-up anger, the pain, the aggression, and the dark, macabre things that Bateman did or didn't do or fantasized about, none of it matters. At the end of the film, he is back at the same conversation that the movie starts out on. The businessmen all sitting around a circle, joking and wanting reservations at Dorcia, which they won't get. But it's a cycle of madness that traps you, and even Bateman's extreme cry to escape it the entire film was ultimately futile. The three ways to view this movie, you could look at the ending this way. The horror film ending, Bateman killed everybody, but it doesn't matter because nobody believes him. The mindfuck movie ending is that there were no killings at all, just fantasy wanting to exert some dominance and individuality away from the conformity. Or the dark comedy ending, where this whole movie was just too ridiculous to ever take seriously, or think about that deeply. All three versions of how you wanna view the movie are completely valid in my opinion, but what do you guys think? Let me know all your thoughts, feelings, and opinions about American Psycho and what makes you love this movie or what makes you hate it. I would super appreciate it if you left some comments and a like because all interactions will help the video be seen in the algorithm better. And if you'd like to see more movie reviews and analysis on this channel, it's the best way to give me some incentive to let me know that you guys enjoy it. So please leave a like and a comment. Other than that, guys, if you do want to support the channel on that deeper level, I have a Patreon and merch store linked down below in the description. And besides that, I appreciate all you guys watching this, and I'll talk to you next time.